Hi, I'm Tom. I heard we were doing a thing. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm excited to talk about terminal whispering today. And what I mean by that is how we can speak to our terminals, the things that we use a lot every day, um, and tell them things other than like just display this text. Um, we use a lot of tools every day. Look, let's look at some of those. Um, we use terminals to do things. Look, So we use terminals to do things like, here's a, a terminal session where I'm gonna type a command and after I'm gonna hit enter and that's gonna move the cursor down a line and it's gonna show me the output of that command, move the cursor down one more line and write stuff, right? This call and response way that we use the terminal a lot. It's really useful. We get this nice history going back. You know, Python uses this, Bash uses this. Um, but then there are a few things that are a little more interesting. When I hit get status, we found that I had that stuff in color there. That's kind of interesting. Maybe that, that's one of the mysteries we wanna unlock. How could we display our stuff in color? With LS here, um, if you try LS in your own machine and then resize your window and try it again, you'll find that LS checks to see how wide your terminal is and how wide your different file names are to figure out how many columns it should use to display the output. So that's a thing that we could do and, and it makes you know, LS nicer to use. So there's something interesting going on there too. So it's an example of another thing where you couldn't do this, a superpower we'd like to be able to, to learn about. Um, what else? We say we've got um, a program like, come back to it. Um, this is kind of interesting. It's a program maybe you've, you've, you probably have used this. It's called Top. It goes full screen, sort of, in your terminal. And you could maybe imagine how to do this. You could just print a bunch of stuff and then wait a second and print it all again. And maybe if you knew how big the terminal was, you could, it would just go away. But that's not what's happening here, because when we quit, it all went away. All right, so something else is another mystery we'd like to unlock. How could we have stuff there and then when I scroll back through my history, I won't see a ton of this top output. Um, something else about top is when you pipe it into something else, it behaves differently. So you, we don't get those kind of, it's in a little format that's a little bit easier to parse. Um, so it would be neat if we could build tools that behave differently when we're piping them into another program. So we're, we're using that input programmatically or when, they're, when it's a human interactively looking at it. Another fun thing we can do is have, um, oops, having to retrigger these. Um, you can build whole graphical interfaces at the terminal. So here's an example of a program called PUDB. It's a debugger in Python I like to use. And uh, look at that. It's a Turbo Graphics kind of inspired, fun, um, or I mean like Turbo Pascal sort of. It's a full, like this is a full widget library that was used called Erwid that was used to, to build this. And this means you don't maybe have to reach for, for QT or for Tkinter or something if you want to build a application. It, it's not really friendly maybe for someone not excited about using the terminal, but if you're building developer tools, maybe other developers would be comfortable using this. And maybe this is nicer than the PDB interface, which is the, the Python debugger that comes with Python, where you have all the same information. The key bindings are all the same, but you have to keep more things in your head. Right? These graphical displays are kind of nice for this. All right, so those are, the, those are the things we want to learn how to do, and we'll pick out the specific things, like how, how we could do that. There, at least, we saw like, there was terminal interaction. I hit a key, things happened. Um, we were printing things in color. Um, there was windowing stuff going on, but maybe we can imagine how we would do windowing with code if we could at least write out those windows. Okay, so what are terminals? Here, what I'm talking about is this thing, and it's sort of important that we've got a little Mac Chrome there because uh, I am talking about Unix terminals, and portions of this are relevant to the, the Windows normal terminal or the or PowerShell and things, but I don't understand how much, and I'm not gonna go into those kinds of things, but um, the paradigm is similar. Um, but another thing we mean by terminals, what I'm, I call that thing a terminal emulator, and what we're emulating is these things, which were themselves called terminal emulators. This is video terminals, maybe. Um, and if you think about the kinds of things these could do, it, it matches pretty well with our terminal emulators now. You couldn't resize these, maybe, so that's sort of a newer thing that's come around. Um, but these were also emulating something. And the thing that, that these were emulating was uh, teletype machines. So these are typewriters that are wired up. These have been around for about 100 years. This is an old technology, um, and it's basically a typewriter, but when you type keys in addition to maybe the arm hitting the paper and putting something on it, maybe it also sends a signal. Um, maybe there's another way to input things with these punch tape card things. Um, 
but it's really the, the paradigm was this is a typewriter. When I hit a key, text will appear there, but maybe I will also send that message to someone else, and maybe they can send me messages, and that will cause keys to you know, put ink to paper without me hitting the key. So it can type by itself sometimes. Maybe we go back and forth between those two. Um, and I think we're really, it's helpful to think about this, and we'll, we'll call back to this a little bit as we're going through what we can tell our terminals to do, because a lot of it makes more sense if you think about typewriters. <laughs> um, I want to read a little bit of a ad here from, this is, what's the year? Uh, from 57, um, the golden anniversary year of the Teletype Corporation. This is an ad in a magazine about how cool these Teletype devices are. It says, a Teletype printer is a communications device with a keyboard similar to a typewriter that enables you to send and receive printed messages. With it, written word can be sent instantaneously by wire within the office or plant or clear across the country to a single destination or any number of destinations at the same time. So we're being very broad here. We're just saying like, hey, you can send messages. That, isn't that cool? And we should keep in mind these are very general devices. Maybe the thing on the other side is another person, which is I think at this point in the ad what this business account manager person is imagining. And then in the next paragraph, we go on to say, uh, where is it? In today's business world, in fact, teletype equipment is often more than a communications instrument. It is a basic element in production control systems. Its ability to transmit and reproduce text and punch to tape is harnessed to office automation. It provides a conveyor system, in quotes, for channeling complex raw data to computing centers thousands of miles away. I and mean, that's more like how we use these now, right? But originally, they are, they are like typewriters, you know, telegraph machines maybe, for sending messages to another person, and maybe that other person is actually a computer. All right, I have this kind of simple model I want us to think about where this is a typewriter, right? Fingers, press keys. When you press the key, ink hits the page, right? There's no chance for it to maybe not do that. I mean, you're changing what's on the paper, and then we add to that the signal over a metal wire that talks to like, application, which is maybe a person, maybe it's a, a computer. And then um, I don't know how those wires work. Maybe they're made of metal, and that sends information back to our typewriter, teletypewriter, and that might cause it to print more stuff. Um, in this modernized version, um, I'm going to say, let's use the system calls, fread and fwrite instead. Um, and we won't talk much about the GUI stuff, but somehow, um, unless you actually have a, a real sort of video terminal hooked up to your computer, um, you're using a terminal emulator, which somehow gets the stuff to the screen. So the, the thing I call the terminal is your terminal emulator, and it knows what to display on the screen. And then this is a Python talk, so I'm really going to talk about print and input. And it's a Python 3 talk, so by input, I mean something that uh, it's not going to run the code. It's not the, the weird input from Python 2. This is like raw input in Python 2. And it might, if you're just looking at something like this, you could imagine maybe, like, why, why do we need the terminal step when we're sending from the keyboard, we have key presses, why not have them go straight to our application? Well, an obvious one is that when we type input, we actually, we don't get those keystrokes until the user hits enter. So there's some buffering or something going on here. It's a kind of the terminal and the operating system working together. But there, it's important to talk about the terminal because those keystrokes are intermediated by the terminal. And it, for example, in this case, with input, you don't actually read the line until the user hits enter. Right, and then come back the same way. It's not important to talk about. Okay, so what bytes can we send? What messages can we tell our terminals to do? This is in our program, we can say print, or maybe in an interactive session, we can, we can just print stuff out ourselves. Uh, first off, ASCII bytes. Um, these are mostly pretty reasonable, pretty boring. If you ha print out an A, it will probably display an A. Uh, here's an ASCII, well, uh, here's the Python 3 way to do this. We're talking about bytes still, so I'm not doing it actually on the standard out object, because that does encoding for us. So, if you say sys.standardout.buffer.write, you can write a byte string. You can just send some bytes to the terminal, and probably what's going to show up in the terminal is, is some bytes now. Um, but there are also these control characters. In the ANSI spec, or sorry, the ASCII spec, there are the first 32, I think, characters are things that don't show up on your terminal the same way, or they don't look like what they are, basically. They do something more interesting. So we're going to look at those a little bit. Here's this, this ASCII code chart. I'm saying these ones here are yeah, so these ones here are kind of boring, but these ones here are kind of interesting. There's something something interesting going on with all of these, and we're going to look at a few of them 
we try this. And this is a fun thing you can you can try your own computer. You've got it up now. Um, let's go to. Oops, I can't find my. There we go. Now we could try this stuff here. I can say things like print uh, hello. And that kind of works. Whoops, but of course, right? Classic thing. We're in Python three here. So we're being clear about what we're printing. All right, so we can print things um, like this. But it's going to get a little complicated because we also use that for the like, input and output of the interactive Python program here. So instead of this, I'm going to do something a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to have two different sessions. On the right-hand side here, I'm running netcat. And we're going to just listen on a port. Uh, listen on 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, over here, we're going to uh, connect to that. Oops. Um, dot connect to that port, and now I can send things over. The advantage of this is that return values of things are going to come up here, right? But um, the actual bytes that are being printed are going to be shown here. This is more like in a normal program. You don't have the REPL like, printing the representation of everything, every expression you type. So hopefully this will be a little bit clearer. So I can send these bytes over there, and they show up. All right, so th this is nothing interesting yet. But let's try printing some other uh, bytes. How about we're all familiar with this one. Um, new line, right? When I write a new line, uh, I won't actually see a character over here. It's just going to change where the cursor is. So right now, I guess we can't even see the cursor, unfortunately. Um, why is that? All right. We'll have to jump over, I guess. Darn. Um, when I send this, what happens is that now the cursor is down here. Okay. So three reasons why we could have predicted that. Let's look at some others that are sort of more interesting. Um, I write some more text, and now I do um, backslash b. What do you think is going to happen? Anyone familiar with this one? Yes, it is. Um, what happens is the cursor moved back one line. Let's try it again. Oh, now it's back one more. Now it's back one more. Uh, this is kind of interesting, right? It, it's starting to suggest that our terminal is really more of a canvas and we can write things on it. Um, this sort of makes sense on a typewriter. You can move, there's a, a little carriage, you can move back and forth. Um, so that we have in ANSI ways to move the cursor back and forth. And now I could overwrite there, right? So I can say things like hi, and that overwrites over there, right? Hi, hi, hi. Okay, so now we could have a, we have backspace. And there's a kind of more convenient backspace we're going to use instead, which is backslash r, it's called carriage return. As in, if you're at a uh, typewriter, return the carriage back over to the, what would it be? If the paper's on it, I guess it would be over to the right, so that your cursor's over on the left now. So if I write that, um, now my cursor's all the way over here. Um, if you're trying this interactively, you can just do it at the normal Python prompt. It's just a little confusing. Or you can just do this setup where I open that socket and connect it over here. Um, and now I can rewrite what's there. It can say, you know, something else entirely. Something else entirely. Cool. All right, so now we have the secret. We've unlocked the secret of progress bars. If you've used command line tools, right, that print something, and then they print out something else on that same line, maybe it's a status thing, maybe it's a kind of status bar that completes as you go, we can do that now. Um, and this is just in the, there's nothing super fancy about this. It's just in it's one of the ASCII bytes that does this. Um, Let's look at another favorite ASCII byte line. Um, slash x, I believe it's e. Um, didn't appear to do anything. What was that? Well, we'll, we'll get to this later. Slash x, so it wants a full zero e. Um, it doesn't look like anything happened here, but if I write some more bytes, um, uh, it does this. So this is one of the things, this is the special character that says, hey, typewriter, shift out the sets of characters you were using and use this other set of characters. And this is if, when you cat a binary file right to the terminal and you end up with kind of a messed up terminal. This is one of the things that could have happened. You're, you've accidentally written, is it byte 15 or 16? My, my, anyone? E would be 14, right? Yeah? What is that? I'm just going to check because I'm so confused. Uh, slash x. O-E. Yeah, OK, 14, got it. Yeah, so if, you, if that byte has been written, maybe it's in this mode. And you could do, I think, 15 to switch it, or you can, you can just reset your terminal. Um, 
All right, so that progress bar thing, that, that's, that's relevant. That's actually useful. Uh, let's take a look at that. Um, here's an example of a progress bar if you weren't sure what I was talking about. Right, wget seems to do this. It's printing this here. We could do this now because we're going to print, do something, print. We're going to use carriage returns. Uh, here's an example of what that might look like. Um, report progress. I'm saying how wide the terminal, how wide I want my progress bar to be, um, some decimal, which is how done we are printing this stuff out. A relevant bit here is that, so now you'll see that we're not writing bytes anymore, we're writing strings. Um, and we'll, we'll explain this, we'll hand wave this away in a moment, um, but good to notice, because now I'm writing directly to standard error. Um, and we're flushing, because the buffer doesn't always flush. It doesn't always actually print the stuff if you haven't done a new line. So it's important to do that flush. But with this, you can now add progress bars. Who, who writes command tool, command line tools sometimes for, for work or for fun? Maybe they check the weather, maybe they, they do important business applications or something. So on any of these, if there's everything you're waiting for, maybe it would be nice to have a progress bar. Maybe it could just print like 4,000 files cataloged, or it can be a fun thing, um, or it could be like printing out um, fractals, like when you compile PyPy or something. You can do whatever you want. It's kind of fun to be able to have this moving thing, but without really wrecking your history, because you're just using this one line. Um, what other bytes can we send? Um, Okay, so the encoding thing, this is just a thing to be, it's more explicit in Python 3, which is nice, because we're talking about ASCII, you can get away with not worrying about it, but it'll become an issue eventually. Um, I can write um, several bytes here, and maybe what we'll get, if the terminal's using encoding, is we'll get a single character. We'd actually get an Enya here, and I'm saying that, I'm claiming these two are kind of equivalent. Um, and just good to know that you can write bytes on standard out if you need to with this buffer thing, but usually we write um, strings instead. Our sys.standard out kind of gets its dot encoding attribute um, based on this variable called term, this environmental variable called capital T E R M in your environment. And sometimes if that is messed up, um, it can guess wrong and, and have the wrong encoding. All right, but now let's look at things that don't just make sense on typewriters. Everything so far just that works on typewriters, we can do fancier stuff. Um, we can also send ANSI escape sequences. These get exciting. Um, this one, you might, you could just try printing it out and seeing what happens. I'll, I guess I should demo it because it's just fun to see there. So what happens if now I send slash x1b, which is a way to write the escape character, um, and then I say open square bracket 33m, um, like, oh, well, it doesn't look like anything happened here, um, but maybe I could write some more bytes and we'll see that, oh, now, now they're in yellow. Um, so two things here. One, I guess we already knew that our terminals had state based on when I sent that shift to the other set of characters thing. But also they have state to do with, am I writing color right now? What color is it? Um, and that, that's just bytes. So these, if you have bytes that can change formatting things, you could take those bytes and say stick them in a file and then read them later and they'll still do formatting things. You can, um, in my favorite blog post of recent history, uh, the other day, you can make blinking commit messages by putting bytes that have these things in your commit message, and they're just bytes. It's not like a system call that says, hey, please change this terminal to be yellow. It's stored there in the bytes. So you can put it in a file, cat out the file later. You can store it in here, and um, here, uh, and describing like how to enter in this text editor those special escape characters, because if you're not a programming language, it's often more difficult to describe that escape character. But then we can do this, and if you haven't got it to work kind of here. But if you have these bytes, it, it's going to be this blinking thing. Um, so kind of fun. I, I like that. Um, here are some more ANSI escape sequences. Uh, the Wikipedia article is great for this. Um, we can move the cursor around the screen. and Move the cursor 23 rows up. So that's something that didn't make sense in a typewriter. And so there's no ASCII way to do that. But we can just move this around. Uh, we can clear the entire screen. We can hide the cursor. Um, maybe if you're doing something where it, the typing model doesn't really work. You want to hide the cursor and it's a game or something. Um, start writing in bold, start writing in red, and then there's also like stop writing in bold. So those are kind of stateful things where the terminal knows it's in bold right now. Uh, all right, well, we run into some problems with this though. These are, um, so ANSI, that implies some standardization, right? Some, some board, maybe an American board, did, did something to standardize uh, that these were the ones, which means at some point there wasn't a standard and there was chaos. Um, and it's still kind of chaos, and let's talk about that a bit. 
Uh, say that it's, it's 1984, so you log into your favorite VBS, and there's this cool, neat stuff, especially if you're, you know, whether you're 13 or 30, I'm sure it's, it, or, or 50 or, or anything, I'm sure it's cool, but um, I, I was young at the time, and I remember seeing this at a friend's house. It was pretty cool. Um, but what if you then you got home to your own terminal, and you try to log into this thing, and it doesn't display right, because then you got the same bytes, but your terminal, your video display, didn't treat it the same way. Um, that would be, be disappointing. And we had... Well, so who's who's done some JavaScript before? Who's used jQuery with that JavaScript before? Um, who's tried to do similar things you tried to do in jQuery but done them with JavaScript and run into browser incompatibility issues? So we had this problem a few years earlier. Um, the browser wars, you know, before different browsers implemented different things differently, different terminals uh, implemented different escape sequences. And there were some really popular ones that kind of pushed these particular ones, the ANSI escape sequences, but there's a lot of non-standard stuff that's different on different terminals. So we had to solve this problem, and to solve it, we needed our jQuery. I think a thing that's really exciting about jQuery is that it standardizes um, how to do something you know, in this browser and that browser with a compatibility layer. You just say, do this thing, and it figures out how to do it in these different browsers. Um, and the other thing that's pretty cool is it has this, this spiffy interface, the kind of query selector thing was pretty neat. Um, so to do these two things, or well, first for the compatibility part, uh, we made a database of all the different kinds of terminals, and your terminal kind of reports in with this environmental variable that says, hey, I'm, I'm X term or something, or I'm, I'm this terminal, I'm that terminal. And then we have uh, databases, or there's term cap and then later term info of, oh, if you're on this terminal and you want to do this, this is how you do it. So these are system libraries that are probably already installed, but then your program might use them to figure out, oh, how do you move the cursor up? How do you clear the screen? Can this terminal even do this thing? Um, but then we had a library called Curses, which was also the sort of nicer interface. It's, it's not that much nicer, but I mean, it's much nicer, but we can do better, and we'll look at better interfaces in a sec. Um, but this is this library used in lots of programming language when you, in a compatible way, want to say, let's clear the screen. Let's make this blue or black or something. Um, but you can, like jQuery, I think it's less necessary now. Uh, there's been a lot more standardization. Many people are going to be in the same terminal. You can maybe get away with hard coding these things. You shouldn't because it's you know, kind of messy and it'd be nice to have a library do it for you. But if you're just in your own script just for fun, I would start with, just because the learning curve is very, it, it's pretty easy to get started if all you have to do is look up a sequence, print that sequence instead of installing a library. Um, if you look at, tput is a, shell tool, that, um, or a command line tool, that looks things up in that database. And if you're trying to do something with your prompt and you don't want to get into Python, then maybe you could use this to print the right kind of sequence. Um, these are some other things worth looking at the man pages for these different things. They'll tell you about, like, okay, this kind of terminal, here's what sequences it would be. Um, here's an example of using the shell tools, but it's a Python talk. So we ought to be using blessings. Um, Eric Rose wrote this great library, and there's a great talk on his thoughts on designing the library um, at PyCon 2014 that's online. Um, and it makes it a lot nicer. I, I'm not showing the curses example. On his docs in the readme for blessings, which is this library, he shows, here's what this would look like with curses, and, and it's like this, and then here's what this looks like with blessings. So it's this very nice library. Um, but you do need to know what we've already learned, which is that these are just sequences of bytes. So we don't get to say, hey, turn on bold with some method start bold, we have to say print the t.bold, so this wraps this string with start bold and end bold over here. Um, a few things do actually write, but for the most part, it's your job to get these strings from this blessings library and then print them yourself. Um, but there are some nice things like this, this context manager for move the cursor over here, write something, and then move it back. Um, all right, let's solve that full screen mystery with blessings. So, come back in here and import blessings uh, t equals blessings dot where is it blessings dot terminal and we can build these strings with enter full screen here that gives us this thing cool I didn't want to memorize that I'm, I'm happier memorizing enter full screen and I could say s dot send uh, that enter full screen thing except that in Python 3 sockets send bytes um, so I need to encode it but if you're just printing this you wouldn't need to do that so dot encode in uh, UTF-8, let's say. Oops. Um, and then let's close our friend. Great. 
Um, so this all went away. Um, back over here, I could write more bytes. Where did we write some bytes? I can send this. Uh, it shows up there. I still have that other bit set, so we're in this funny font. Um, we can get rid of that by sending slash x. Um, o f, I suppose. Cool. All better. Um, and then there's also a exit full screen. So instead of enter, we can exit. Oops, and we can put paren again. Great, and we're back here. So now we have, this is a tool that we need to go to a full screen thing, do interesting terminal stuff, but not mess up the user's history. Like the, the, one of the first things you get annoyed at when people start doing clever terminal things, it's like, well, that was great while I was in there, but then I wanted to close them and then have my normal call and response terminal history again. Um, here are some of the other secrets kind of unlocked with this technique. Um, just, these are just bytes that we have to write. So we can have colored and styled text. We can have um, moving the cursor anywhere on the screen, this alternate screen we saw. We can hide the cursor. Um, and a lot of other things, a man page T put is nice for this because it, it's the shell tool that does these things for you without Python. Um, and it will have, it produces the sequences for you. And if you don't want to learn to use one of these libraries, you could shell out and use this T put thing, which is a nice interface of T put space some terminal capability. And that produces a string. All right, so we're, I don't know, maybe a third done, um, but we're, we're well in time, so, so we'll speed up a little bit. Um, next up, what happens when the user types at the keyboard? So we've talked about what we can tell the terminal to do. Next up is what, how we get text from the user, and there are different ways that this can happen. Um, so we're talking about that read call and when we get things. First, there's this thing called line discipline, which determines when you hit keys, what happens. Um, and maybe that's when does the input call act when can act, have access to it. Maybe that input call is going to block until the user hits enter. Um, maybe when you hit control C, it's not going to send the control C byte. It's actually going to cause a signal to happen instead. Um, there are rules about how this works. Um, the line discipline, you can try this with cat. Um, you, it's very minimal command line editing. It's actually implemented in the kernel. Um, you do things like, oh, okay, I want a backspace. And you do get this backspace. That's allowed. Um, but all the read line niceties you're used to, you don't have. Uh, so you can try this by typing, you know, just come over here. In the window, we type cat. And I can do things. I can not jump to the beginning of the line with control A. I impulsively wanted to like, oh, I want to go back. Well, I can't do that. I can't jump to the end. The only things I can do are, I think, delete word, delete line or something. And this, this is implemented in the kernel. But there's this. We'll look at it in a sec. There's a user space thing that we can use instead called read line, which does add all those things. But this is just what you get if you are not doing anything special. You're just typing in a terminal, and your program was trying to read bytes. Um, and there are a bunch of terminal settings that are important. The, 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 well, the one we'll look at is echoing back characters. And we'll mention a few of the others later. They all work similarly. Um, we should imagine these as knobs on our terminal. So if we have that video terminal, there's a setting we can hit, because um, it has to do with display things. And this one, echoing back characters, if we had a typewriter, when you hit the key, ink went to the page. right? It was, it was a physical thing. You couldn't say, like, oh, no, just send the message. Um, but then later, that became a, a possible thing. Uh, so the default is that when you type a character, it will echo it back there on the terminal without having to do anything in your program. But if you don't want that to happen, you can turn it off. Um, let's look at how that works. So I'm saying, hey, look, that you can get and set properties about the terminal here. And we'll look at how to do that in Python. Relevant man pages, um, if you want to learn how to do all these things, you can read these. But wait until you, you have to do something and figure it out. Um, STTY is the command line tool for doing this. Again, it's a nice man page to read and learn about terminal capabilities. Um, you say STTY minus echo. And if you try this on your machine, you'll find you can't see what you're typing anymore. So you need a good memory now. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at it for, to aid memory. Um, oops. STTY minus echo. Uh, hello. Oh, you couldn't see that. Um, so we're in this state, but I can say STTY echo, and we're back. Great. When your terminal is messed up like that, so two things I just did. I, went, I moved my cursor back to the top of the screen, moving everything up with Control L. And the other useful thing to do is to type reset. When you have that funny font, when your terminal is yellow and you don't want it to be yellow, um, that mostly fix things fixes things. And the thing I have to do sometimes, if say that we had that echo thing off, um, 
minus echo. I would type reset. Uh, well, probably I'd type, uh, yeah, I'd type reset. I'd hit enter, and it was like, oh, it didn't work, because there were some bytes in front of that that I couldn't see, and so I would type reset again. So my automatic thing, if my terminal is messed up, is to type reset, hit enter, and type reset again, and hit enter. Uh, that, that's pretty safe. It'll, it'll usually be good. Uh, let's do this in Python, though. Um, the get pass method in, or function in this get pass module in the standard library implements this. Um, this is what its code looks like. Um, so this is real code in there. This is the kind of ugly stuff you need to do. You need to set some terminal settings. Um, nice to use a library to do this for you, but in the Python standard library, this is what we do. Um, and the other piece to look at for the shape of this code is the try finally. Um, that's really important because terminals are a resource external to our own programs. The user is going to use, after they're done with our program, they're going to use the terminal for something else. So it's important that if your program crashes because you, and you put the terminal in a funny state, and then, you know, then you, you're, you're done, either you don't clean up your after yourself or you don't get to because your program crashed, then the terminal's in this funny state. We can type reset, we can fix it, but you really ought to use this try finally pattern. And it's Python, so we really could use like a context manager. It might be nice for this, right? It would be nice to be nice to say with no echo. And when you enter that, it sets the terminal and saves the original settings. And when you leave it, it restores those original settings. So that's a good idea. And some of these libraries we'll look at do this for us. Um, we'll use it like this. Secret technique. So we can make it so keys are sent immediately. You hit the key, and immediately that key is available to the application if it was doing a read. Um, we can ask for the current terminal size. Um, so that's what ls was doing before. That's one of these kind of system calls, these PC adder calls. Um, you can ask, is, does it look interactive? And this is a good thing to think about if you're designing command line tools that could be used either way. Um, you don't want to suddenly make your tool not able to be used in scripts because now it has this fun interactive interface. Um, maybe you don't want your progress bars to be printed, or maybe you want to format things one to a line instead of having multiple on a line like ls does. Uh, Non-blocking input, this is another, this is like a, a thing you modify on the file descriptor, but again, a way you can, I think you might want to do if you're building this rich application. You might want to, um, you, you might want, sorry, can someone tell me about time? Is there a session share? Or, yeah. We're at uh, 148. 148, and we're done at two. Is that right? 210, okay, okay, great, great, we're doing all right, all right. Um, right, you don't want to wreck your program, and then or you want you want to be careful about your output, and then also with this non-blocking output, it would be cool if we could um, get input at, you ask for input and would say, no, there's nothing there, and you could keep going, and you could check again later and say, oh, now have they put anything? Because input is gonna block, but maybe it's a real-time game, say, because that's what most of what I've done with the terminal, and you want to keep going, or it's top, and you want to ask if there's anything there, but then you want to refresh the screen, even if there isn't. Um, and the, the other piece is it's your job to map bytes to keys. So if we look at cat again, um, if I say cat, I'm going to hit the up arrow on my keyboard, and it looks like this. And if I receive this, it's, it's two different bytes. Um, if I hit maybe F5, it looks like that. And that's probably one, two, three, four, five bytes. So if you're doing a thing where you're trying to detect keys, it's your job to map possibly multiple bytes to whatever key press it was. Um, here are some examples of, of what I was just showing. Like, and different for different keyboards. Again, you want that look at that database thing. Um, I'll, I'll skip this one. It's, pretty cool, but it, it's sort of a bit off topic. But there's other ways you can interface. I'm talking about it now. There's ways you can interface with the terminal to, to send it a message, and it reads those bytes. And instead of displaying something on the screen, it writes by its bytes back on standard in. And this is to ask where the cursor is. Not a thing you normally need to do, because you can just set where the cursor is. But if you need to know that for some reason, um, you can try this now. If you type print slash x1b open square bracket 6n, you may be surprised to find that now, um, after you do that, there's a new input, and then it comes up with some text as though you had typed it, because this is a message for the application from the terminal. And the way the terminal talks to your application is with standard out and standard in. Um, and really what it's trying to say is this, which is like, yes, the cursor is here since you asked. Um, and of course, this doesn't make as much sense in this line buffered format, but if we had it on where every key was immediately sent, then 
this is a way the terminal can communicate with your application um, over the same wires that you use to type things interactively. Uh, all right, signals quickly. We talked about sometimes when you hit control C, it causes a signal to be sent instead of sending the control C character. So things to be aware of with this are, there are some signals. Um, this is a great article called TTY Demystify. It talks about these a bit. But it, it's your job to turn them off if you want them off. Um, you can do this with those same settings we looked at before. Uh, the term iOS man page is what I wanted to read. Um, and there are some buckets of settings um, that include instructions about how to deal with signals. Um, cooked is the normal thing we're, we're normally in. Raw is this special mode where none of the signals are triggered. So control Z no longer suspends your application. It just receives control Z. Control C doesn't do SIGINT anymore. Um, and C break is a, and also when you're in raw, the program, there's no echo. So you hit a key, you don't see it on the terminal. And the program gets to receive that byte right away. Um, C break is between the two. And it's often what you want if you want to get input right away, but you don't want to deal with signal handling. You still want control C to be a keyboard interrupt. Um, all right, so let, that, was, that was all the theory and how to kind of do it just for fun. Now let's look at the tools we ought to be using when we're doing this. Um, blessings, that's, that's the number one one. If you can, just, you can just read the readme and blessings. You'll learn a lot of the things we just learned here and more importantly, how to use these in a program starting now. Um, Blessed is a blessings fork that is not yet merged and has a bunch of great stuff. And they're working really hard on merging it, but it's, it's not there yet. So if you, were, if you wanted more capabilities, you might look at this. But you have to keep in mind that afterwards, you'll want to be switching back to blessings. Um, it has some nice things like a context manager for C-break that blessings doesn't have. Right? That's that mode where your application gets the key presses immediately. Um, it has this in key, which does that mapping of bytes, and it will say, oh, the user hit F12, even though that was seven bytes that you had to kind of have in your buffer and, and pattern match against. Next up, Erwid. Erwid is how we did that PUDB thing. It, this is a kind of object-oriented widget library, basically, for the terminal. Um, if you're trying to build a cool, you know, beautiful terminal interface that has windows um, and feels like it's you know, a DOS era cool thing, this is what you want. It's, it's terrific. Um, you, it really feels like you're in TK or WX or, or QT or something. Um, this is by Ian Ward, who's an awesome Canadian developer, um, who's reminding you what it was, but we, we'd already seen it. It's that PUDB thing. Um, but just as a reminder, if you take nothing else from this talk, you should use this debugger. It's great. It's really fun to be able to graphically see where you are in your code. Um, Clint and Click are two command line utility libraries, kind of utility libraries where like, oh, you know, it would be nice to have this red. It would be nice to display these ac tiled across the, the terminal. Um, so they have the things you need for writing command line utilities that are not full screen things. They're just fancy things like progress bars. Um, I have not used them much, so I can't say much about them, but I've heard lots of buzz. People really, really like them. Uh, read line is what you want when you think, ah, it would be cool if I could have, you know, tab completion. It'd be great if when I had in this prompt, um, the user could jump their cur cursor back to the beginning of the line. Um, you could do these things yourself, and I've done this for a program called bpython, um, where we were in an environment where we couldn't really use this. But this is what you ought to be using. And this is ipython sensibly just uses readline. And it's the C library that makes it so instead of using the kernel terminal you know, line editing protocol, now we're going to use the one in user space where we can say any keyboard shortcut is anything we want. So control A can go to the beginning of the line. Control R can be reverse iterative search through history. Um, and everybody knows these shortcuts already. So you probably want to use this. Uh, Curtsy's is a library I wrote that uh, I would spend more time on. But um, I think there are other better libraries unless you have very specific use cases. So uh, we use it to write this new front end for bpython, which is this interactive terminal tool, like a replacement for Python. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's awesome. It's great. Yeah, bpython is really, really good. It's really great. Yeah, OK, so, so the latest version, we have now, it's no longer a full screen thing. And yeah, let's look at that real quick. So, bpython, right? It's pretty slick that now it behaves. It does full screen stuff like this, right? So you get your tab completion. You get your help on methods and things. But yeah, you can pop in and out of it, sort of this hybrid, where it does take over the screen for a moment. Um, but then when you go out of it, it still is call and response thing. 
So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. And that's how I learned about all this terminal stuff, basically trying to write this. Um, but Python Prompt Toolkit is a library that does these same things in a little bit better way. And there have been some great, there's a, I think a MySQL um, kind of interactive prompts thing. It has similar features where it can take over the terminal to give you full, full screen auto completion and things, but then behaves like a normal terminal. Um, and we can look at that real quick. It, you, you know, you can see that in the terminal we have this Vim like, or it's Emacs bindings right now, editor. Um, and you know, it, it does some neat stuff. Uh, like when I hit enter here, it highlights that double colon as a syntax error. Um, I would check it out. I, I don't use it because I work on vPython and I'm really excited about vPython, but this frankly looks better. I would, I would check this out too. It's called pvpython. But the, the library, if you want to write your own kind of hybrid full screen yet still call and response oriented tool, um, is called the Python Prompt Toolkit. Um, a PTY is a pseudo terminal. This is a u useful idea for when you have someone else's interactive tool that they didn't make work well with scripting. It's hard to be able to use it when, not as a human. Um, you can run it in this situation and it will think that it's being run interactively, but you can have kind of a map of, you'll receive all the bytes that it was printing to the terminal and you can write bytes that it will end up receiving. Um, I've used this for, it lets you do kind of amusing things like this. If you can tell, um, it, the case is changing um, every few seconds here. So I'm running normal Python inside of a pseudo terminal, and then I take the output of that pseudo terminal and transform it every few seconds just for fun. Right? It's, it's just kind of funny, but it can be used for you're running some interactive tool um, in a controlled way if it wants a terminal. It, it wants to think it's being run interactively. Um, pexpect is kind of the proper way to do the thing we're describing. So how to deal with, there's an older tool called expect that's for interacting with things that want to be interactive. So you have an SSH session and, or a telnet session or something, and you're trying to send it commands, but it's hard to script. Um, so I think to check out if that's a problem that you have. Um, a tool that uses this called Termcast. At this point, this is no longer useful libraries. This is just cool terminal things to be aware of. Um, termcast is pretty awesome. This, it's built around the idea that a terminal session, the, the output is just a stream of bytes. Um, and therefore, you could, in here, we could say something like, telnet uh, termcast.org, and we do have a connection, which is great, and I can do something like, okay, let's watch that one. And we can watch this person play, uh, let's watch, look at a different one. We can watch this person play, um, what do you call them, NetHack style games, roguelikes. Um, this person's look, also looking at a high scores list or something, that's not very interesting. Um, there we go. But, uh, I'm hoping it'll come up at some point with sort of the map overhead view, and none of these people are doing it right now, but the gist is that terminal is, a terminal session, like the output of something, is just the bytes. So you can stream those bytes to your terminal and play them back there, and you have this very high compression, very high fidelity on exactly what's in their terminal. So unfortunate that none of these are, there we go, right? So someone's looking at their inventory, and then it's gonna go back. Um, but they're just, it's just a stream of bytes, even though it no longer looks like a stream of bytes, it looks like this full application thing. So you don't have to do screencasting, say on a very low bandwidth, you can just send the actual bytes. Um, anyway, so cool tool. Um, another tool that does a similar thing and re records terminal sessions and then puts them in this little JavaScript player. Um, it's called ASCII Cinema, or AS, AS Cinema. I'm not sure what the correct way to pronounce it. I can't figure out a, a good way to pronounce it, but it's this neat tool that lets you record a terminal session and then post it online, but it's not a screencast. It's just, oh, you sent these bytes. Great, I'll do those bytes and I'll come up with a similar session. Um, whoops. Um, all right, so I have some other things I could talk, well, okay, we can look at this one. This is kind of cool. This, I think this is a fun use of, another reason you might wanna use these fun escape sequences um, in real development. A lot of times our test runners give the output in the terminal, but if that kind of output is, oh, you know what, there was this thing and this thing and they don't look the same, I can use the underline there to describe which part of it wasn't the same. So this is the tests for BPython where we're doing some of this. Like, so the, I, I say this is like, there's not always have to be interactive tools. Anything where you're in a terminal and you want a prettier picture, this could be useful for. Um, I'm getting close to the end, so if you have questions, start, start percolating. We can talk about things for about 10 minutes. Um, another fun tool, uh, tmuxp, 
is for scripting tmux. And if you ever need to simulate a terminal, I found tmux easier to script than any terminal emulators. Um, so we can do things like run tests here. Um, I guess we don't have this one. Never mind. All right, you, you can do fun things like run um, tries. Like what would happen if I had this program and I changed the terminal size? Would this be treated correctly? And I'm, for some reason, this GIF hasn't loaded for some reason, but. Well, let's not worry about it. Anyway, here, here are some really fun videos of watching these old teletype machines, which are really cool, these mechanical marvels kind of doing the things a terminal emulator would do now. Um, but like very quickly, I just think it's really cool that, that it's mechanical. It's not, um, I just grew up in this era where I just assume everything, like I assume my clock radio had a computer inside of it, when in fact it was just this printed circuit board, and that was amazing. And these are one more level of that. It's like, no, it's a mechanical device that receives the bytes and sends them, or that reads the little punch card things, um, and they make fun, pleasant noise. Um, and then for the reading about, I would wait until you have a thing you need to do and then go read about it, because all this stuff is kind of deep. It's, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, but I thought these were three great articles, and I will post this on my Twitter soon, um, but the slides are not quite up yet. Um, great, that's it, thanks. So I think we, I mean, anyone is welcome to leave now, too, but I think we have five or ten minutes for questions. Do you want to talk about terminal things? Sure. Unfortunately, no. It's just bpython. So you have to, like, if you install it in a virtual environment, it'll just be called bpython. Um, when I'm not in a virtual environment, I will, I'll, I install bpython, and then I install python 3, and, or sorry, I install bpython for python 3, I rename that executable to bpython3, and then I uh, do the bpython1. Uh, we talked about that, um, and one of the maintainers is, is kind of not a fan. Um, but it's interesting. It probably should, right? There's, like, there's pip3 and pip. Um, but I think the thought is it's not that essential. I don't know, often, if you use it in a virtual environment, you'll get what you expect. If it's a Python 3 virtual environment, and you install bpython, you'll have that one. Actually, while I'm taking questions, I should put this in the background, because it's kind of fun. Any, anybody else? Yeah. I have a question about the uh, Sure. Uh, one thing in Python that is not the fun is the screen in the Python system. Why does Play Play have to be Android? Can you kind of take the server control and plug in the Android to get the server to route, or is there a transaction that's just sending these bytes into their terminal? Oh, yeah, 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 awesome. Sure. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Anybody else? This is bpython. It's not what this talk is on, but I think bpython is great. We should all use it. It's really cool. Um, it's great for discoverability, I think, for, for kind of when you're learning Python and you don't have the string methods memorized yet. Um, I mean, it's, it's quicker than looking at docs to just have that autocompletion there right away. Yeah. There, mm -hmm. not 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 to the degree of pry. Pry stuff is they're doing some cool stuff with that. Um, there is a thing called PDB, which ships with bpython, um, but it's mostly like a normal debugger that launches bpython when you want a shell, which PUDB will also do. You can say like, okay, the, the shell I want is this. Um, we talked about right ways to try to, yeah, to integrate a debugger. There there aren't right now basically. Um, PDB is essentially the normal, is, is essentially PD, sorry, BPDB, the bpython1, is essentially PDB, normal Python 1, and when you ask for a shell, you get bpython. It doesn't have some of the cool stuff that's integrated in IPython. If anyone doesn't use, the real message I should give is if you use normal Python, if you type Python at the command line prompt and hit enter, uh, you, I don't think you should do that. I think you should be using IPython or bpython or something more interactive, and then, it is another level of complexity, which is not great, right? When there's a bug, you don't know if it's in Python. It could just be with this library, and then you have to go back to Python. But I think it's worth it uh, for like, the discoverability tab completion gives you. And IPython has some terrific like, debugger capabilities, like, oh, when an exception was raised, hop back to that frame stuff. So we don't have, there's not plans to add something like that, kind of. Um, and if, yeah, if you've not tried IPython, 
You've you probably heard about it at this point, but you should try check it out. Not just the IPython notebook, which is also pretty cool, but the IPython in a terminal session, because um, it has you know, neat features kind of like this. They're not quite as in your face, um, and they're a little more traditional, um, which, which is good in a lot of ways. It uses readline instead of us having to re-implement all of readline <laughs> to be able to do these things, which is an interesting choice. Anybody else? Great. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for coming. Cheers.